Big Fight Preview. Today we are discussing Edgar Berlanga versus Pedrag McCrory. We have Berlanga who's looking to snap his KO drought as of late against a very tough, undefeated, very confident Irishman in, in McCrory. So I am Chris Algieri in studio with two-time world champion Holy Malinaji. We have the legend Teddy Atlas joining us and also George, a legend in his own right, George Jacobin. All right, George, let's take this one away. Wow, calling me a legend. That is some intro. Chris, you're hired. You're the, you're the <laughs> intro guy because you, hi you, get a, you get us hyped to do this. Well, guys, we are talking about Berlanga and McCrory. Chris has set this up. So, Teddy, uh, in, in McCrory, look, you look at his record. He's 18-0, nine knockouts, unbeaten Irishman. But when you look closer at his record, he really doesn't have much on his resume. And Berlanga is a guy who everyone at 168 is, is talking about Canelo. And this division, by the way, might be might be the second best division in the sport. A lot of a lot of good names. Yet Berlanga's fighting McCrory, who is an unknown. So let's start this with your thoughts on this matchup. McCrory started five years old, a little late. You know, usually not always, but a little late. It can make you sort of raise your eyebrows a little bit, right? We when we're hand, handicapping. A fight, we try to look at all aspects of it, things that will tell us something. Getting the big one now at 35, does that tell us something? Um, of course, Belongo's only 26 years old, young, young kid. Uh, the best, you mentioned the competition. It's always about the competition, whoever you fought. He's 18 and 0, nine knockouts, not a big puncher. He can punch, he goes to the body well. You know, he can punch fairly solid, but not a huge puncher. Um, especially when you consider he hasn't fought any big names and he's only got nine knockouts. Uh, probably the best competition he's been in with was recently with Woodall uh, across the pond. You know, Woodall, veteran, has fought a lot of, you know, top guys, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, solid fighters. And Woodall had him hurt, you know, getting ready for this. I did my homework, looked at it. Woodall had him hurt on the inside. Uh, had him hurt, actually got his attention again in a fight twice. And maybe, you know, what Chris said with the opening is prophetic, where maybe there's the one that can snap the the string of, decisions that Belanga has had in his last five fights where before that he's had you know he's been known for knockouts um 16 straight first round knockouts is the way Belanga started his career I don't think it's the right way to start his career and I I'll get right into this I think a lot of people were way up on Belanga you know another kid from the from Brooklyn you know we we've had a lot Bronx. of great fighters uh, a lot of great fighters come from Brooklyn, and he's from you the know Bronx, Polly. He's from the Bronx. I think he's from the Bronx, Ted. But yeah, Bronx. All right, uh, we'll move him to the Bronx. It's not tough you know, New Yorker. We'll, we'll, we'll go up the we'll go up the Brooklyn Expressway. We'll go up there, uh, across Bronx Expressway. A lot of traffic. <laughs> but we're, he trained we're, a lot in Brooklyn, there. so he could be Brooklyn too. Chris, do you ever take on either way? I don't want to cut you off. <laughs> no, no. It's uh, hey, the, I'm sure the fans will. Uh, have fun taking some shots at me. Teddy, you don't know the difference between Brooklyn and the Bronx. <laughs> yeah, You know, uh, I do a little bit. Brooklyn has chocolate egg creams. The Bronx does not. Okay? <laughs> so I, I know that much. I thought he was from Brooklyn. Either way, New Yorker, um, he's a... I think they heard him getting them 16 straight one-round knockouts. I'll tell you why. It got the attention, just like Tyson when he got all the knockouts. It it got him on the map, got him on the radar, got people talking about him within the sport, uh, interested in him, excited about him. But what good did it do him? It didn't teach him anything. It didn't improve him. It didn't improve him on his trajectory to be in a better fighter. Because at the end of the day, yeah, you want to build a record. Yeah, you want to make money. Yeah, you want to, you know, build a fan base. But yeah, you want to become a better fighter. You want to become a better fighter. You know, you can't forget about that. And 16 straight one-round knockouts doesn't make you a better fighter. And I think that a lot of people got down on him 
uh, after he started getting decisions instead of knockouts. And there was two reasons that he got decisions instead of knockouts. Number one, started finding better guys, guys that he probably could have fought a little earlier. And number two, he's looking for the knockout it took him a little while. I think he's starting to get better now. I think he's starting to turn the corner a little bit in that way um, and and develop a little. But coming off 16 straight one-round knockouts, he was thinking, I'm going to get in there, I'm going to hit the guy, I'm going to go home. And he wasn't developing the things that all fighters have to develop. All the assets that, you know, qualities that you have to develop to be a top pro to be a world champ, ultimately, because that's what this is all about for these guys. So I think that that, I really thought that stagnated him a little bit. But I think now he's getting to where he needs to be to identify who he needs to be. Because when you score 16 straight, and look, let's, let's be real straight about it. You're giving guys cannon fodder. You, when when you're getting 16 straight now, you're not giving them guys that you're going to take away anything and say, okay, he got better with this. He had to use his jab more than He had to cut the ring down more than He had to go to the body more in this fight. He had to move his head more in this fight. He had to control distance more in this. No, you're not getting any of that. He had to walk across the ring, hit the guy, and go home. Hmm. And I, again, I, I take a strong stance on that as a trainer, that you're not, at the end of the day, you're not doing them any favor. I think he's working his way out of that control that that situation where he's learning now all of the putting together the the mindset, obviously the the technical uh things that you have to put together to get to that next place. And he has fought better fighters his last five fights. Um he's I think that I don't think he was the puncher that they made him out to be. He's a good puncher. He's a big, strong kid. He punches well. But I don't think he was that puncher. But more importantly, it doesn't matter what I think. It's a matter of what did he learn? What did he find out? Who am I? It really comes out. Who am I? What I, I always say when development fighter, one of the most important things you can do is help them develop their identity what they are. They can't be Joe Frazier one minute and then Muhammad Ali the next and then Pernell Whitaker the next. They they have to know what their identity I think he's starting to find out what his identity is. And I think his identity is a guy that leads the way with a really strong foam pole jab, like a George Foreman. He's got a real accurate straight jab, a guy that has good, decent skills. Technically, he's pretty solid. I think this fight is a coming out party. I think that this fight is really, he, we forgot about him a little bit. This is a fight that's really important to remember that Belanga, is he the next guy to be excited about? And can he be a player at 168 pounds? Yeah, you know, he's, he's coach, you know, he's been a guy who's uh drawn a lot of curiosity out of out of the boxing community you know you talk about the 16 first round knockouts you even made a comparison to Tyson when he was getting all those knockouts i think you know when you're young sometimes there can be a little bit of a i don't know what i don't want to call it distraction or you know too many things cluttering your head um i think when Berlanga had all those first round knockouts, it's almost like he lost interest. It's almost like he, he took it for granted that it was, was going to come that easy. Because once it stopped coming that easy, he sort of struggled more than everybody expected. And that sort of wiped some of the luster of, of some of the shine off of, off of the, uh, the product, so to speak. And that's, I mean, ever since then, he's sort of been trying to get it back. I actually don't think going all the rounds in these, in these recent fights has been a bad thing for him. I think he, it's, it's allowed him to get back on a track where he's been able to sort of start to refocus. You know, he got with Mark Farade, who was, was his trainer earlier in his career, uh, sort of got, kind of went back to the basics, went back to his roots. And I think sometimes that can happen where you kind of realize, well, I'm getting myself lost in, in the shuffle over here. I have to cover up, compartmentalize too many things. Let me eliminate some things and let me go back to my basics. Sometimes that's all it really takes. And I, I don't really mind that he's gone the rounds recently because I think it's allowed him to sort of 
love boxing again. I, I feel like he took it for granted. I agree with you, Bully. Yeah. I think it was necessary. Yeah. I think I, the round. I think I I I I think it's always going to be necessary for guys to go rounds, as you said, uh, Teddy. But I also think that he himself, for his own mindset, was taking it for granted. Like you said, you just walk across the ring and, and you hit the guy, and they go away. And you're like, all right, this is how it's going to a boxing career is going to be like this. You almost when you're young, you almost fall into that denial pretty pretty easily. When you're 30 years old, if you get a few first round knockouts in a row, you, you're mature enough to realize it's not always going to be like that. But when you're young. Sometimes you think, hey, man, you know what? This is how it's going to be. Let's just, you know, it'll be that easy. And I think maybe you start to fall out of love with what you're doing because you feel like you can do other things. And this doesn't really interest you as much anymore. Getting better doesn't really interest you as much anymore. Until he started to struggle when he went around. And then all of a sudden the criticism comes. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, whoa, it's not all, all rosy over here. Uh, these people are writing me off. Oh, uh, I'm not getting the, uh, the, the shine I was getting before. And it almost gave him that uh, the sort of chip on his shoulder to go back, get back to the basics and do what he's got to do and get the important rounds in. I feel like you know we've gotten to see certain improvements in these fights where he's had to go rounds, where we've seen him go from struggling to sort of getting better and better and getting sharper. And I think his last fight, he, was, he, he looked the best that, that I'd seen him look in those fights that he'd gone rounds, you know? Um, I guess another Irishman, uh, actually. But I, I, I think the difference when we bring up Tyson, and maybe it's social media, I don't know. Social media can sort of put you into the... Into You're a, talking about his fight with Quigley, probably, Yeah, with right? Quigley, yeah. And, and I think it was maybe with, it might be social media where you become a sort of a lightning rod much more much more easily than you would have in the 80s when, when Tyson was getting all these knockouts. Now, granted, they, they weren't all first-round knockouts with Tyson, but he was on a knockout streak. And once he started going rounds, okay, we say it didn't improve him to get all those knockouts, but... One thing about Tyson, he didn't lose the hunger. Because when he was going rounds, when he started going rounds with guys like James Quick Tillis and guys like that, you know what? You can still see the ferocity in him. He was still looking to be the best. I almost felt like uh, Berlanga, to a degree, almost lost an interest where he didn't really care how ferocious he looked. Okay, we're going to go rounds, whatever. And it wasn't really some, once he didn't get the first round knockouts, he almost started struggling because it, it, it was what he expected. Meantime, when Tyson started going rounds, it was like, okay, you want to go rounds with me? I'm insulted that you want to go rounds with me. I'm going to keep being ferocious. Now, does that mean he looked great every time? No. I mean, once he, but he, it took him winning a world championship to start going rounds more consistently. We saw the Tony Tucker fight, the Bone Crusher Smith fights where he went 12 rounds. But, you know, I think, uh, I think with Berlanga, it's one of those situations where uh, I think these rounds have done, have done good for him, and I think it's allowed him to sort of fall back in love with what he wants to do. You, you, know, you both made great points, and I agree with, with a lot of the things you said. So I'm going to speak from my personal experience with, with Edgar, because I was in the gym with him in Brooklyn for a lot of those first-round knockouts. And he I is remember, from Brooklyn. Is he from Brooklyn? Uh, he is Brooklyn. Is he, he is Brooklyn. Brooklyn. I mean, we yeah, trained. Where, where, Brooklyn. Did I get this, where did I get the Bronx from, man? I'm, okay. I'm losing my mind. Teddy, my apologies. Uh, no, not it's fine. No problem. So uh, yeah, it was. Thank it was, you, thank you. Um, you know what it is? Chris, I'm a stereotypical. I, I just assume all, all Puerto Ricans are from the Bronx. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say. My, it. My, my bad. <laughs> I don't want to say. Not all Puerto Ricans are in the Bronx. <laughs> so we we trained in Brooklyn with. Uh, I, I tell you, no, I tell you, I just got to say, you know, a little movie reference for Paulie, um, <laughs> to Chris. Uh, absolute consigliere. <laughs> <laughs> you so go. I trained with uh, Uncle Dre, Andre Razier in, in Brooklyn, um, and that was the time when Edgar was was coming up with all these knockouts. And I was also working for for Top Rank, doing some of their international shows. And I remember Carl Moretti always coming up to me, being like, "Chris, is this kid for real? Like, is he like we scoring all these first round knockouts? Is he really for real?" And I'm like, "Hey, man, I see him in the gym. He's he's going rounds. So we're not just getting in there and just knocking guys out. Like, he works hard in the gym." He was working for it. And I think to, to, just to back up exactly the points you guys made, yeah, it got kind of easy for him when he was fight night. He was working hard in the gym, but it's not the same. No, psychology. It's not too. the same. You have that idea. So, all right, I'm going to work really hard in the gym. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to touch the guys. I turn to dust. I go home. I rake my hand raise. And then I go hang out with Fat Joe at the club. You know, that, that, that's kind of the idea that, uh, you know, that's kind of the idea that. Maybe that's why I thought he was from the Bronx. He's hanging out with Fat Joe. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm making excuses for myself. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then he started to get the fights with these guys who were, who were at a higher level, more closer to world class, and he starts going rounds. And yeah, he struggled at times. Guess what? We all do. We all do when we step up in, in, in terms of um, we go from much easier fights to world class guys, especially when you don't have that pedigree, you don't have those, those, those rounds in. Listen, his 17th pro fight was his 17th round, if you really think about it. That's crazy yeah. to think about. And he was fighting tough, really tough guys who had been in with real guys at that point. So yeah, he's got yeah. five fights in a row that went the distance. Good. I agree with you guys. Good. He's got some round under his belt. He's got that professional experience where he's deep in a fight and goes, man, I got to dig deep. I got to do this. I got to figure out a way. And he has. The last fight, I thought he looked the best. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to credit 
the work that he's been doing down over at uh, with, with Mark Ferre down in, in Plant City in Tampa because they're getting him real sparring now. And I think that's the most important thing. You know, Teddy, I don't want to take words out of your mouth, but I'm thinking about, you know, Mike Tyson. When he's blasting all these guys early, early on, you've told us stories on air. He had real sparring, really tough guys through those years. Um, you were smart about it, even when he was young, but you were getting him the right kind of, kind of work on the, uh, you know, outside of the outside of fight night. And I think that's really important for a guy like Berlanga because that's when you're going to build your confidence. That's when you're going to build your skill set. That's when you're going to build up that dig deep down mentality where you're going to be in tough rounds in the gym so you can bring it out on fight night. And I think that's where he's at now, and that's why we're going to see a more improved Edgar Berlanga. And to your point that you said from the start, Teddy, I don't know, this, this kid, this kid's really confident. And he comes and he throws that right hand. He might present himself a lot of opportunities for Berlanga to capitalize on and potentially end that drought. I think All right, so. Well, speaking about Edgar Berlanga, Brooklyn's Edgar Berlanga, we had a chance to talk to him. Here's what Edgar had to say to us. Like, this is when I want to get get it over with now you know because it's like we super locked in you know and uh i just want to like i feel like when i'm in camp i'm not myself you know i'm 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 a different person you know i'm i'm like more like i'm like i could say like anti-social you know i don't really like to speak to nobody i like to just really just focus on 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 what i got in front of me i gotta look like a star like i gotta shine bright next week like literally like make this dude look like he's not in my category you get what I'm saying? And really perform my ass off next week. So that way, the boxing world starts talking about this shit, you know, like, like wow, oh, damn, oh, damn, he's back. Okay, yeah, now, now they're going to start talking his name. Now he don't got an opponent. Now he's like, damn, we can make it happen, you know. So that's, like, what's on my mind right now is just next week and really perform. That's why I'm so locked in because I know it's a it's – a, it's something big that's going to happen next week in a positive way. And, you know, I'm just, I'm ready. I'm excited. Canelo got that, that thing that he's like, oh, you know, um, I'm not fighting a Mexican fighter. So it's the difference that if I look, if I, if I look impressive, it's like, oh, we could take that fight. Because why? Oh, he's Puerto Rican. You get what I'm saying? You know, he fought Cotto already too. So I got to revenge that loss from, from Cotto, man. He knows like, he knows that that'll be a big fight, you know, because at the end of the day, he knows like I got PR. I got Puerto Rico. I got a whole country behind me. Literally, like, the whole country. Like, when I go to Puerto Rico, I'm like, I get bum rushed everywhere, you know, restaurants at the airport, walking in the street, you know. So, like, that's a big fight regardless, even if I don't even have a title and whatnot. But I'm just I'm just that much of a big draw, you know, in boxing. But also, I got an island behind me. Well, we thank the fabulous Tris Dixon, one of the best writers on the planet, for that interview. So, Teddy, uh, quick reactions from you guys. You know, you can't escape the Canelo talk, but he Edgar knows he's got to look good. He wants to look good next week. And uh, Canelo's always the carrot, Teddy, at 168. That's dangling. So how do you react to what Edgar says, his mind frame? It was a short clip, but... I think it lives up. But I think it falls... I think it's consistent with what all three of us just said, that uh, he... And what Bully touched on. I, I think that he's... You know, I, I use his word that he's locked back into, you know, his trajectory of his career to where he needs to go, where he's interested again, where he may have lost some interest or gotten down a little bit uh, from a emotional, mental standpoint when people weren't talking about him as much after, you know, breaking a KO streak and then getting a few decisions in a row. People weren't looking at that he stepped up in competition, he was fighting better guys. He was getting what he was going to need, you know, to be a top fighter. They were just saying, oh, he's not that. Really? I mean, that's what happens when you knock out 16. Oh, he's not that. And now you're not knocking him out anymore. And I, I think that he just proved that it bothered him. And I think that that's a good thing. Because it sounds like, again, to what Paulie and Chris touched on, it sounds like, Kind of like the point Paul was making about Tyson, that he's he wants to get back there and be ferocious again. You know, he that that he's got that I hate to say this because you're always supposed to have that fire. You're a pro fighter. You know, if you're a professional lawyer, you have to have that fire going in a courtroom. What whatever it is that you do. But it sounds like he's got that fire again. Like he's got something, you know, that bothered him and something that's pushing him now to prove something. Uh and that he's driven. 
Uh, and he's, uh, like he said, he's locked in a mental state uh, as far as his mental state. And that is, that is, I've said it a million times, I've said it a million and one. No matter how you are technically, no matter how you are physically, you got to be right mentally in this business, really in anything in life, but especially in this business. I think he's right mentally. I think that's what that interview uh, told me. And I'll leave it with this. He reminds me, I, I think he will get a, have a good chance to get a knockout. Taking nothing away from McCrory. Uh, McCrory's a, a game game guy, you know, solid guy, technically solid. You know, he gets extension on his punches. For the most part, he wants to fight on the outside, but he'll press from the outside. You know, he's right in front of you. And he's not a great inside fighter. I think Belanga's a better inside fighter. I think Belanga can get it on the outside with the right hand pull he touched on, or he can get it on the inside. And also, Belanga's a good body puncher. So um, I, I think he's got a chance to break that drought. And the thing I I wanted to compare him a little bit to a guy who's a world champion, and he's now in his weight class, uh, Munguia. McGill, when he first came out, he was a raw guy. He needed experience. He still is. He's still a work in progress, McGill. Believe it or not, with 40-something fights and world he's still a work in progress. But he has progressed. He has gotten better. He was just a big, strong guy. And I, I look at Belunga a little bit like that, that he's still developing. And I'll give him a little, people probably get surprised when I say this, but I think he's more developed skill-wise than McGee. I know McGee is a world champion. He's in line for big fights, and I like McGee a lot. But they're both big, strong guys. I think Belanga, believe it or not, even though he's at a lower point right now, he hasn't won a title. He hasn't fought the, you know, the top, top guys yet. But I think that he is more developed in his skill sets than McGee in some ways. We got more to come on this fight. Pro Box TV is where we are at. One of the best fighters in the world, Timo Lopez, is always watching Pro Box TV. What's up, everybody? It's Teofimo Lopez, The Takeover, and you're watching Pro Box TV on the Boxing Channel. Let's go. So keys to victory. Um, let let's let's start really with the underdog because you look at the odds and Berlanga's a minus four fifty favorite. McCrory is plus three twenty five. So Paulie, um, McCrory, he's a, he's a pretty big underdog. What does he have to do to have a shot to win this fight? I think uh, uh, one thing that stood out to me in the footage I saw of McCrory is uh, he's got a pretty good right hand. He's only got a fifty percent knockout ratio, but he's got a good right hand. Um, the only thing I would I would basically say he's a key with that right hand is in the way you're going to land it, right? He's a little bit wide with it at times. Uh, he's got good power with it, but I think you need to vary it uh, a little bit. If you keep throwing it the same way, even if you throw it wide, um, it's going to be difficult to land it the way you want to land it. I think he's, he, if he mixes it up by throwing it straight down the middle and sometimes around the way he likes to throw it, I think if you can vary that a little bit, you take away the anticipation because part of uh, a big part of defense is anticipation you know so so you vary a little bit you have you eliminate your opponent's ability to anticipate the way the shots are coming and and Berlanga will be right in front of you at times you know because he himself looks for combinations he looks for uh, looks to be aggressive so uh, I, I think there's there will be opportunities for uh, for McCrory to land that right hand if he can properly vary it and and then disguise it the right way so Chris what about Berlanga he, he's the big favorite what does he have to do uh, you know, I think I think Teddy actually touched on it. Uh, the the boxing skill set of Edgar Belanga is much higher than people give him credit for. He's got a very good jab, and when he's active with that jab, he hides the big power that's in the right hand and the counter uh, check hook that he has. He's got a really good lead left hook. Um, coupling that with the body work, like you said, Teddy, it makes him a very dangerous guy offensively to deal with. Um, but I think it all comes from the jab. When Edgar's got that jab going, it's very quick. It sets up the right hand beautifully. It's got good. It's got good technical acuity, and when it's busy, it's a very dangerous punch. The problem is the last couple of fights, he has not been that busy with it. I think if he can really focus on that lead hand and getting getting um, McCrory into position to land that right hand, because one thing that McCrory does that I think is a real uh, a flaw is he'll he'll post out his lead hand to throw the right because he's so he's so confident in that right hand. He really wants to land that right hand. He'll post that lead hand out, 
just to land that right hand. I think there's going to be opportunities for Berlanga to counter that using a sharp jab and, a, and the overhand right above that jab as he punches with that, like Champ said, more wide right hand. So really, for, for Berlanga, keep it fundamentally sound. Straight punches, use the jab, right hands over the top, and when you have opportunities, check the check with the left hook and hit the body whenever possible. And Champ, that's exactly one of the things... Uh, um the, one of those things that you mentioned with that that leading the lead hand, you know, that's that's a bit of a tell as oh, well. Yeah. So he's got to like like that goes back to what I said about disguising the right hand. It's got to be disguised. When you're doing things like that, you're actually failing to disguise it the way you want to disguise it. And I think maybe that's what makes his right hand a little bit wide because he sticks that left hand out. So then it's harder yeah, to throw a straight hand, right yeah. hand when you're already sticking yeah, it out when you there. Yeah, you got that shoulder out front like that. So uh, again, part of that disguise, uh, he's got to be a bit more tricky. Well, you know who did that well was Quigley. Mm -hmm. Quigley disguised his right hands well in that fight. He boxed really well. He moved very well. He used a good in and out, plus being offensive when he needed to. Landed some really good right hands in the fight, but was just just disguising the offense enough, just tricky enough uh, to make it to the end of that fight. He almost ran out of gas in time. But I think he, McCrory should really watch that Quigley fight and see if there's different ways to, to land on Berlanga. All right, you see our sportsbetting.ag, our betting partner. You see the odds are up on the screen. Like we said, Berlanga is a pretty big favorite. Now we get down to the predictions part of the show. So, Teddy, who do you have in this fight and why? I have Belanga stopping, uh, ending the drought, <laughs> ending the drought. Take nothing away from McQuarrie, tough, gritty guy, solid enough guy. Um, but I saw him get hurt with Woodall. I saw why he got hurt. He, he was a little fat. Uh, with one of his shots, he got caught uh, inside one of those shots. I think there will be opportunities for Belanga to do the same thing on the inside or on the outside that Paulie talked about and that Chris talked about with the right hand. Also, Belanga, what Chris said, his jab is the key. He, he's got a jab. I don't say this too often, but... In some spots, it looked like a George Foreman jab. I mean, it's, but he don't always use it enough, but it is a phone pole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is everything Chris said. At the end of the day, simply put, it's hard. <laughs> it's, it hurts. It's hard, and it's accurate, and it's straight. That's why it's accurate. It's straight. And that that can discombobulate a guy. Forget about that. It can set up, you know, you set the table with the jab, and you eat with the right hand. It can... Keep the guy from getting any rhythm going. It discombobulates guys. They don't get a rhythm going when you hit them with that kind of jab. And I'll finish with this. He's got one other thing, guys, that he does really, really well. And it shows you that his level of expertise, ta technique, development is higher than, as Chris said, than a lot of people think it is. He throws a really good, Right up and cut to the body. Counter. Counter. Right up and cut to the body. He'll dip under, he'll make you miss, and he'll throw this nice short right up and cut uh, counter to the body. He does that really well. I like him to, I like him to get, a, get back to the knockout game. I, 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 I see it at about round seven for Belanga. Uh, I will say this. Don't look too good doing it because Canelo won't fight you. <laughs> you know, you're looking, you know, we're at the point where we know if you look too good, Canelo's not going to want to do with you. You actually, it's almost at a point where you almost got to be offended if Canelo picks you as an opponent. You got to be, you got you to be happy you get paid, but it's almost like, wow, he picked me as an opponent. Does that mean I'm not that good? You know, so don't look too good. But at the same time, you know, if you look a little bit iffy, maybe you wind up in the Canelo sweepstakes. Me and Paulie are not <laughs> taking any trip to Mexico in the near future. <laughs> Mexicans like Chris is. I, don't, go ahead, Chris. I don't think any of us are taking a trip to uh, to Ireland anytime soon because I, I agree with you guys. I got I got Berlanga winning this fight by stoppage, probably in the mid rounds. But I think there's going to be opportunities for McCrory, McCrory to make this exciting, and I think it's actually going to be a fun fight while it lasts. It's going to be a bit of a shootout. I think he's very confident. I think he's got a good right hand. He believes in his power. There's going to be opportunities for him to land on Berlanga. I just don't think there's going to be enough firepower. And I think that confidence is going to allow openings for Berlanga to get that vaunted power in there. And I agree with you, Teddy. I think we're going to see an end to this, this decision drought. I got Berlanga by stoppage. All right. Well, there you heard it. From the three experts, they are picking Edgar Berlanga to, to end the knockout drought when he takes on Padraig McCrory. That's going to be February 24th on DAZN. Make sure you check it out because that super middleweight division is one of the best in boxing. And subscribe to us on YouTube. We're at almost 93,000 subscribers. 
man, there's some kind of prizes that are going to be given out when we get to 100,000. It's right around the corner. So make sure you subscribe. And remember, remember, remember this. Pro Box TV is your boxing channel.